Hello, everyone. Welcome to 3D Mesa's webinar, Hybrid Manufacturing, Transforming the Future of Machine Shops, a topic that I am personally very excited about today. My name is Madeline Pryor. You may have seen me one or two times before, and I'm actually going to be the moderator of the webinar today. And I'm actually joined by our panelists, Peter Genovese and Kenny Betts, who are both from SolidCam. Good afternoon to you both, gentlemen. Good afternoon. And I will introduce myself and the panelists in a little bit, but before we get started and while people are still trickling in, I actually have a poll for all of you. If you could just take a moment to answer it. Um, you should see it now on your screens. It's just a few questions so that we can get to know you, uh, where you're coming from, and give us a better idea of the audience itself. Uh, so please, uh, Take a look and answer that. I'll leave it up for a little bit to give you time to look through everything. Uh, also, while we're doing some housekeeping, just to let you know, there will be a Q&A session in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. You can make, uh, you can ask all your questions in the Q&A section, which you should be able to see on the bottom of your screen. Please, please ask your questions there. The reason is because we are much less likely to lose them. Uh, what's also really great about the Q&A section is that you can actually upvote on questions you want answered as well. So don't hesitate to select ones that you are really interested in, etc. because we will obviously take ones that are popular as well. If you want to learn about it, well, we want to answer it for you. Uh, an additional note, the webinar today is actually being recorded. A replay will be available on Vimeo afterwards. Um, if you want to know, please just get in touch with us. We will be very happy to answer um, and send you the recording if you would like to share it or just show it to your friends afterwards or just watch it again. Um, and let's actually get into it. So if we move on to the next slide, I would like to quickly just introduce the webinar itself. Uh, and so here's the agenda. Right now we are in instruction where I will let you know a little bit more about our panelists, our solid cam as well before getting a little bit more into giving you some context about hybrid manufacturing, specifically CNC machining and hybrid manufacturing. Uh, then I will actually let our panelists take it away. First, introduce a little bit more about solid time in case you don't know uh, about it, before turning even more into what exactly hybrid manufacturing is, how it works, especially with 3D printing. And we'll also be looking at uh, some very, very interesting case studies. So get ready for that, where we show you how the metal 3D printing in particular and uh, CNC machining can be combined to make incredible parts. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's question and answer period at the end. A little bit of a broken record, but do please ask your questions in the Q&A section because that makes it much more likely that we will see them and be able to answer them. Uh, I think, that we have gotten a lot of answers. So I will just end the poll here. Actually, just to share the results with all of you, we have a couple of interesting things. It seems a lot of you are working in the field of AM already. So definitely, um, it'll be interesting to see, but we have a solid man who aren't. So well, welcome. We hope we teach you a lot about hybrid manufacturing. Uh, quite a few of you also have 3D printers. Um, though you are using FDM, uh, metal is actually what we will focus on today, but it's very interesting and obviously it's going to be brought in for other technologies. Uh, and you have a lot of, well, we have a very even split on the different ways you are using your 3D prints, a lot of prototyping and proof of concepts, concepts, but of course also production, samples, functional parts. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and moving on now. Uh, Moving on to the next slide, please. As I mentioned in the beginning, my name is Madeline Fire. I am the English content specialist for 3D Native, which is the largest, largest international online media platform for 3D printing and is actually available in five languages, unsurprisingly English, but also French, German, Spanish, and Italian. Uh, and I'm, as I mentioned, the moderator of this panel, notably with the Q&A. Moving on to our panelists, first we have Peter Genovese, who is a 3D printing applications engineer. He is a trained 3D printing specialist. Uh, he's a trained 3D printing specialist and engineer, and he's previously worked as a manufacturing engineer and completed studies at Rowan University in the US. Next, we also have Kenny Betts, who is an additive account manager with extensive experience helping companies to integrate additive tech. 
Notably, he helped our, he works on helping them to leverage it, leverage the advantages of hybrid manufacturing, and he studied at Rutgers University. So both our panelists really well versed in both 3D printing and hybrid manufacturing. A great addition to the panel. I'm really excited to hear what they will say. And just to tell you a bit, they are both from Solid Chem. And for those of you who may not know the company, it was founded in 1984 and is actually a global leader in innovative what computer aided manufacturing or CAM software for CNC machining. Uh, they are a worldwide um, company, and actually since 2022, they have also been a desktop metal sales partner and have specialized in providing combined 3D printing and CNC machining solutions. CNC machining, um, and actually we'll move on to the next slide as well. Since we have a lot of 3D printing specialists, just in case, uh, CNC machining, you've probably heard of it, but it stands for computer numerical control. Uh, it's one of the largest manufacturing industries in the world. Actually, you can already see that in this graph here. In 2021, it was worth about $96.4 billion. And by 2030, it's actually expected to reach $153.8 billion. So enormous market, uh, one of the leading methods for manufacturing parts. And actually moving on to the next slide, uh, just in comparison, I also wanted to show the metal additive manufacturing uh, market, since often the two are combined. Um, the metal additive manufacturing market is one that is growing extremely rapidly. Uh, it was worth 2.54 billion in 2021. And in 2020-30, it's actually expected to be worth about 11.45 billion. So you can see it's, uh, exponential growth is expected in the sector, um, even though it takes up less of the segment. Um, and additionally, that's not even counting polymers, that's just metal because I wanted to focus on it for this webinar. Uh, that being said, I do want to mention, neither technology can really be said to be a total replacement or substitute for the other. They have very different strengths and weaknesses. And where we are seeing some of the most value in production and in growing production is in the hybrid approach by combining the two, which is what we'll be talking to you, to you about today. And actually, just a little bit more information. If you look at this pie chart, that actually shows the industries where we are seeing a huge adoption of hybrid manufacturing, specifically not just the machining or 3D printing, but both together. The largest is undoubtedly aerospace, unsurprising when you consider how many metal, how often they adopt metal 3D printing, but also tooling and molding, medical, and there's a large section for others. So you can see it's really spread across a number of different industries and sectors, and it's just growing in popularity. So it's really important to understand it, which is why we're here today. Um, and that actually is about enough from me. I will be putting you in the capable hands of our experts, Kenny and Peter. Once again, broken record, but do not forget you can ask questions at any point during the webinar in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We will be answering them at the end, at least in the last 15 minutes. We will try and get to as many questions as we can, but we will also give you contact information at the end if you want to get in touch or if you had a question that wasn't answered, but we we will do our best. But please upvote them, please take a look. And well, if you're interested in watching it again, we will also be putting it online. So stay tuned for that. So I will say, take it away guys, and let's get it started. Oh, thank you very much, Maddie. Perfect. So uh, we discussed a little bit about solid cam. Um, but this slide kind of shows our international presence all over the world. Um, so we work with customers in a diversified set of industries, uh, basically everywhere uh, and almost every country throughout. Uh, what this unique advantage has for us is we get a lot of feedback from our customers and we really have a pulse on the industry. Um, so we can see you know, what things are working, um, where they're working, trends that are coming through the industry. Uh, so this gives us a good overview of kind of, you know, you know the entire market for both CNC and uh, a growing market for the additive and hybrid approach. So if you don't know uh, too much about SolidCam, um, you know, we are a, a CAM manufacturing software development company. Uh, one of our flagship products, uh, if you're familiar with us, is called iMachining. Uh, what we do is we take solid blocks of material and we quickly rough them out. Uh, through iMachining, it's our patented toolpath algorithms. Um, it allows you to reduce cycle times, save tool life. Uh, so, you know, every year or so, we do a comparison on our competitors. We look around for other software manufacturers that are doing good jobs, you know, on this, make sure that we're the best. 
integrate more, um, innovate also. Around 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, we started seeing something a little bit different. Uh, instead of being able to you know, rough out a, a, a part, uh, you can now print your rough part. This reduces cycle times by about 100%. It doesn't hurt tooling at all. Uh, so, you know, in our comparison advantage, we say instead of trying to beat this, uh, let's let's join it. Let's add it in. Uh, so we launched in 2022. Um, SolidCam Additive does uh, hardware agnostic hybrid consulting, uh, demystifying AM. Uh, what we see a lot of the time is with uh, you know 3D printing companies. There's a lot of marketing out there. They say that you can pretty much do anything. That it's easy. You press a button. You come back. You have a part. Not exactly that. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, there is a lot more technical technicalities that you have to uh, account for when, uh, when, uh, when working in the hybrid or AM environment. Um, so we like to help our customers along the way, point them in the right direction, um, let them know what type of technology, what type of hardware, what's coming online. We were at Rapid uh, a week ago, so we got to see a lot of the new cool stuff. We like to keep uh, you know, an eye on what's, what's coming out, how that can help our customer base. Um, the next thing we do is a hybrid cam solution. So this is actually the integration of uh, within the CNC machine, you have the mill and you have a hybrid head attached to each other. Uh, this way you can actually, you know, add material onto uh, repairing parts, or you can start from scratch, start adding, and then subtract along the way. So you're milling what you're adding all at once. Um, this does a really good job of keeping your tolerances, making the parts exactly how you want them. Um, and it's a, a new way to create these complex objects and geometries that you really couldn't do uh, one way or the other. Uh, the other thing is we are a value-added reseller for desktop metal. Uh, behind me, you can see our desktop metal shop. Uh, this is a great solution for the machine shop, for the service bureau, uh, even for if you're doing small volume production, you want to bring it in-house. Uh, this is a great way to do it. Um, we use this every day. Uh, on this side is the desktop metal furnace. Uh, it, I don't think you can hear it, hopefully, but right now it is cooking parts. So we are turning um, you know, green state part, which is basically bound together metal powder, uh, you center that together and you pop out metal parts. Um, so that's been going right now. Uh, doesn't heat up too much or anything like that. It, it gets right below melting temperature, but they did a really good job of creating this technology so you can basically put it anywhere. Um, all right, next slide. All right, so uh, solid competitive is our mission statement. We believe that to stay competitive, the shop of tomorrow will really need to embrace hybrid manufacturing. Um, we're here to help guide our customers in this uh, you know, in this pursuit, um, putting the technology in their hands, kind of, you know, giving them a good overview of what's going to help them best, where to go in the future, what to integrate, and, uh, you know, hopefully not make any large mistakes along the way, because uh, uh, this technology is very expensive. So you want to make sure you have the right piece for what you're needed, uh, what your customers want, uh, and we help you help you with that. And you can see one of our face mills that we made right there. Um, that's Anthony, our CTO, holding that. I believe that was at IMTS. Uh, last year. So uh, some pretty cool stuff that we're doing in-house also. All right, next slide. So where is additive headed? Um, you know, a lot of machinists that we talk to, especially when you're creating near net shapes, they're thinking that you're replacing their job. Uh, this is not the case at all. Uh, hybrid manufacturing is really using the complementary nature of both additive and subtractive manufacturing. Um, it gives you the, the, the best advantage of everything. Um, you know, at first, machinists might be a little bit scared. You're trying to take our jobs. Uh, after about a year of having a, a technology in place, they're like, I, this is amazing. This is awesome. This is the, the best thing ever. Like, this is allowing us to do things we never thought we could do before. Uh, it, it just works really great. So, you know, they're not trying to replace each other. Um, they're complementary. They augment and, and supplement traditional manufacturing practices. All right, so about 90% of AM parts, uh, they're all near net. So they're close, not exactly, not to the tolerance that you need them on the blueprints. Um, most are gonna need some sort of post-processing, whether finishing surfaces or you know, bringing them into tolerance using CNC machining. Planning for this upfront makes a lot of difference. Um, you may have heard of DFAM, which is designed for additive manufacturing. We add uh, an extra thing here at our, uh, at our company, it's plus 10. That's Tim. <laughs> Tim is our uh, CNC machinist. Uh, he's standing in front of the Hermley that you see behind Peter also. Uh, we use him right off the bat. As soon as we get a part in, we start talking to him. Hey, how are you going to hold this? How are you going to work with this? You know, this is the parts we need hit. You know, get him involved. Get your manufacturing, uh, you know, get your engineers with your machinists. 
get them talking together because uh, sending a part down the line to your machinist after you've already done everything, they have no idea what you're, you know, what you're talking about. And you're like, how the heck am I going to get this done? So if you incorporate them early, you start that discussion, it makes everything easier. You're not scrapping parts. Um, it just makes the whole process work very well and, and getting them involved early, you know, showing them the technology, showing them how it works, gets them a better understanding and then they can really just start flying down the road. So what does hybrid manufacturing actually look like? Uh, so Kenny alluded to this a little bit before. Um, there's kind of two main styles of hybrid manufacturing. Um, these are the names that we give them. That's not necessarily standardized in the industry, but that's how we'll refer to them. Uh, so the first is simultaneous hybrid manufacturing. So that's what Kenny was talking about, where you have a single machine that has both additive capabilities and subtractive capabilities. Um, so for example, you might take a machine like the Hermley behind me, uh, and you'll physically attach some type of additive 3D printing attachment to it. Uh, and you'll be able to print some portion of the part, put that tool head away, bring in your subtractive cutters and start machining that part all in the exact same setup and the exact same machine. The alternative to this is a little more common. It's called sequential uh, hybrid manufacturing. This is where you'll have completely separate processes for your additive and your subtractive. Um, so for example, like the part we have on the screen, we may take a part, um, we'll 3D print it to roughly near net shape in one system, uh, do all the processing that's required for the additive side of things. Then we'll take those parts over to a subtractive machining center and we'll do all of our subtractive operations there. Uh, each method has its own pros and cons, uh, really just depends on what type of uh, parts you're trying to produce and what systems you have available to you. So before we get into the actual benefits of hybrid manufacturing, we have to talk a little bit about optimizing for it. Um, how do you get the best results out of this process? Uh, and probably the most important thing right off the bat is choosing the right parts for this process. So if someone comes to you with what is uh, functionally a sheet metal part, you probably don't wanna look at additive for producing that part, at least not directly, right? Maybe we'll 3D print some tooling to produce that part, but the part itself isn't necessarily a great fit for additive. Um, and this is something that uh, inherently machinists and engineers seem to understand about a lot of other processes out there. Um, you know, if you're designing for injection molding, there are certain things that work and certain things that don't. Uh, unfortunately, and this is one of the myths that we have to try and dispel is that uh, a lot of people seem to think of additive as a, a magic wand that you can just wave over any part and just click a button and you have it in your hands. Um, it's a manufacturing process like any other. There are uh, benefits to it, there are downsides to it, um, and there are practical limitations to it as well. Uh, one of the first things that we'll do when we're working with a customer is we'll look at their part portfolio and find parts that make sense for uh, additive manufacturing and for hybrid manufacturing. Um, just because the part itself can't be 3D printed or shouldn't be uh, 3D printed doesn't mean we can't use additive manufacturing to aid in the traditional manufacturing process, however. The next big thing is understanding your requirements. Uh, and this can be said of really any manufacturing process. Uh, understanding what your part physically needs to do and why those requirements are there. Uh, it is pretty often that you'll start discussing with an engineer about a print that they've given you. Um, you'll ask them, hey, why do we have that tolerance here? Uh, and oftentimes they may not have the answer that you're hoping for. It might be, uh, that seemed good enough, or, oh, that's the tolerance we put on the last print that I did, so I figured it would be fine here. Um, you'll say that with material callouts and finish requirements. Um, it takes a lot of effort to drill down to every single requirement you're putting on a print and really understand why it's there and what its purpose is. Uh, and unfortunately, that's just times uh, that a lot of companies don't have to spend these days. Uh, but when it comes to additive, you really have to look carefully at each one of those requirements and see, do I actually need this? Uh, what is the goal of this requirement? What are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, and by asking those right questions, we can start to open up some more freedom. You know, this entire portion of this part, maybe we actually don't need to hold that type of tolerance. And that might mean that that part can be left in the as printed state. Um, just avoid the subtractive portion of the, that uh, equation entirely. Um, so very important to understand your requirements. The next thing is considering the whole process. You know, we talked about DFAM plus TIM. Uh, a lot of times it's easy to get really fixated on just the, the cool, new, exciting, the 3D printing portion of this. Um, and you might toil away to optimize the part as perfectly as you can for 3D printing. And you might get it to the point where, you know, the part right off the machine is like 95% the part you want. But because you did all that optimizing on the additive side, that last 5% you need to get to might be a nightmare for the machine. Is how do I hold this part? How do I fixture it? Um, how do I get access to the regions of this part that are now occluded and in really weird locations? Uh, how do I probe the part and, and bring it into, uh, into spec on my machine? If you consider that whole process, a lot of times you'll find that it actually makes more sense to kind of back away from that final part, actually print a slightly rougher shape, uh, and sometimes even add features. We'll show you some examples of that later on uh, that aren't actually needed for the final part, but are needed for steps later in that process. Uh, whether that's uh, built-in fixturing for uh, work holding or potentially uh, inspection points where you can probe that part to uh, center it on your machine. Uh, and last one, we've seen a, a big resurgence of this in the last few years is software simulation tools. 
these can really help take a lot of the guesswork out of that initial design optimization. Um, we're seeing things like topology optimization and generative design, and we're also seeing simulation tools on the actual printing side as well. Uh, so simulating that entire printing process, uh, helping to take some of the guesswork out of some of the weird oddities you might find in that process as you uh, start to dig a bit deeper. So what are some of the benefits of this hybrid approach? Well, right off the bat, the one that most people are most familiar with is going to be that you have a lot more design freedom with your parts. Uh, we talked a lot about the generative design tools and topology optimization tools, where you uh, essentially give your software some set of requirements. You know, I need to go from point A to point B, and it needs to be this strong and this lightweight. Um, and you'll spit out this crazy, crazy geometry that uh, traditionally would have been kind of a nightmare uh, and might be cost prohibitive or just physically impossible to produce with traditional manufacturing methods. But with the advent of additive, we're actually able to open the door on a lot of these technologies. Uh, and we're able to create parts that we just couldn't create traditionally. Another big push that we're seeing in the industry in the last few decades is this concept of kind of lights out manufacturing. So obviously there are 24 hours in a day, right? And if we can utilize all 24 of those hours, especially without needing to have uh, staff on site to babysit those machines, we can be much more productive. We can start reducing costs um, and just produce more parts more efficiently. In CNC, this requires a lot of upfront investment in the, uh, in the facility and the equipments. Uh, machines like the one behind me have the capacity to do lights out machining. You can have automated tool loading, uh, automated pallet loading, where you'll actually have a robot that will place new stock material in the machine and the machine can keep on running. Uh, but that gets very expensive very fast and most machines have to be retrofitted to accommodate this. The thing with additive is that traditionally, most of these processes are pretty long processes. You might be printing for dozens or even hundreds of hours in a single job, depending on the system. Uh, and that kind of necessitates that that machine needs to be able to run without human intervention. So a lot of the new machines that we're seeing on the market are actually designed with this type of automation already in mind. Uh, they're already cloud connected for monitoring remotely, so you don't have to have operators babysitting these machines. And we're seeing more and more facilities being built up that are almost entirely autonomous, right? You can have 20 machines to a single operator and still be maintaining the, that equipment. Another huge benefit of hybrid is this concept of digital tooling. So for producing a traditional part, there is uh, tooling that is required to do that. That might be the literal cutters that are needed to cut away and shape that material. That might be the fixturing and work holding uh, equipment that is needed to keep that part in place while you're doing that machining. For something like uh, bending or forming or casting, you may have dies or molds that are needed. And the thing with that is that all of that tooling is generally bespoke to a particular part that you're making. Uh, with injection molding is a great example of this, where even if you have a part that is only slightly different than the part you were just making, you need a completely different set of tools to make that part. With 3D printing though, it enables you to quickly change to an entirely new product without changing potentially anything about that actual machine setup. The concept of digital tooling is that everything that the machine needs to make this new part is digital. It's just digital information stored within that part file. And the machine itself is capable of making a wide array of parts. So for things like mass customization, um, whether that's as simple as uh, you know, putting a customer's name on a part or uh, as advanced as you know, custom molding, say a, a gear shift handle to an exact customer's hand, that's enabling this now. Uh, and lastly, one of the big things with all of this is that reduced cycle time. Uh, if you look at some alternatives to hybrid manufacturing where you might be taking, uh, say, a cast blank and you'll machine that blank away, uh, casting can be a pretty long and arduous process. Uh, and that's not something you can normally bring in-house. So now you're beholden to some third party, um, their production schedules, their timelines, before you even get the material in-house. But by bringing hybrid, uh, hybrid manufacturing in-house, which is much easier to do than a lot of alternatives, now you have full control of that entire production cycle, and it's generally greatly reduced compared to the alternatives that are out there. So let's talk about some of the example parts that leverage some of these benefits. So this is the face mill that we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, a face mill is just a, a cutting implement that's used on a CNC mill like the one behind me. Uh, its job is just to remove material. The way that it does it for this style of face mill is we have what's known as uh, indexable cutters. Uh, so there are little chunks of hard material that actually do the cutting work. But that means that the body whose job it is to hold these cutters really just needs to hold those cutters in place. And we start thinking about it in that context. That means you have actually a lot of freedom about the, the form and geometry of the, the holder that holds those inserts. Now, traditionally, some of the creativity that engineers might come up with would be a little prohibitive to actually produce. Um, one of the things that's been really popular in the last decade or so is this concept of through spindle coolant. So when you're using a cutting tool, it's really important to keep that material cold uh, and also to evacuate the chips that you're making so that you don't cause issues with the part. One of the ways we do this is by blasting high pressure coolant directly at the part while we're cutting. The most efficient way to do this would be to put coolant exactly where we need it, right at the tip of the tool. Now, this can be hard to do if you don't actually have coolant coming from the tool itself. Um, and so in the last few years, we've seen a, a large number of manufacturers start adding internal cooling channels to the actual cutters themselves. 
This can be expensive to do, it can be difficult to do, um, and there are some geometries they just can't accomplish with traditional methods. Additive, however, lets you put in geometries like that directly into the part. So here we have our design that we've made in CAD. We 3D print this part, um, and because this is a binder jetting part, we'll then center that part into a piece of solid metal. And then we actually have very few faces that we need to clean up in the hybrid uh, technique. So really, we just need to clean up the location where our inserts are going to sit and any locations where we have screws or threaded features. Uh, and that makes this part a really, really strong part for hybrid manufacturing, because there's actually very few subtractive techniques that are needed on this part after it's produced. So again, some of the benefits for this part, the internal cooling channels would be difficult to produce by other means, uh, more complexity and design freedom, so we can really get crazy with the geometry of this part, uh, and the reduced machining time, which is important for uh, you know, that bottom line of making sure these products are produced as cheaply as possible while maintaining quality. This next one's a really fun part. Uh, so this is a spindle for an electric race car. Uh, and this uh, essentially it will attach the, uh, the brake rotor and the wheels to the main system and actually uh, drive that system. So in this case, if we were to do, produce this with subtractive methods, we'd have to start with a piece of stock material that's larger than the entire part. Uh, in this case, it's about six inches tall, six inches in diameter. It's a pretty reasonable piece of stock material. Uh, this particular part was made out of 17-4 stainless steel. So you're starting with a piece of material that's almost 30 pounds. Uh, for context, the final part mass is less than two pounds. The difference between that is ending up as scrap on your floor. And obviously, yes, you can recycle that, though there is some carbon footprint associated with that as well. There's some cost associated to that. Uh, and obviously, this is a lot of material to remove on your CNC equipment. So that's rough on the equipment, um, and it's a very, fairly long amount of machining to do. With our hybrid approach, though, we actually print a near net shape that removes the vast majority of this material. We go from taking off uh, almost 20, uh, almost 30 pounds of material in the traditional method to having to take off only about half a pound of material in the subtractive method. So this is our part right here that we have before we've actually done any post machining on it. And the benefits to this really is the, uh, the massive reduction that we're seeing in that uh, material waste. So obviously we can get some more complex geometries with this. Uh, we can enable our designers to go and, and have a much more effective design for their application, but we can dramatically reduce the machining time and the material waste that you'd see with this design if it was made with traditional methods. Another strong example of this would be uh, linkages. Um, so we're seeing more and more of these really highly organic shapes and forms that are coming out of some of these new design softwares. Uh, we talked about aerospace, they absolutely love to do parts like this. Aerospace is a great industry where the right answer is whatever makes the best part, right? They're not as concerned with the cost of fabrication, they're concerned with what is the strongest, lightest, most perfect way to make this particular part. Uh, and unfortunately that oftentimes means that those parts become very expensive. Um, in aerospace, it's okay, it's worth it because we're talking about saving lives here. Uh, but anything we can do to reduce those costs are obviously going to be beneficial to us. Uh, that's where hybrid can really shine. So a part like this, for example, this is simplified and done by hand, but could have been produced with a topology optimization or generative design tools, where we've essentially told it, hey, there's, there's two whole locations we really care about, and we need to connect those two locations. But the path and form you take to get there is less critical. We just need to do so in a strong and lightweight manner. And that can produce some fairly organic geometry that's quite difficult to machine. But when you kind of turn it on its head and think about what you've just told that software to do for you, you said that uh, what's in between these two holes right here, we, we don't really care what that looks like. Tolerances aren't as critical here. So that tells us that, hey, we might be able to leave that entire center section completely as 3D printed. We may not have to touch that with a CNC machine at all. And if all we really care about is the position of those two holes, that dramatically simplifies our setup for the work holding and the actual machining process itself. Now, there are other ways you could achieve the same shape, right? Uh, we could look at casting or forgings. Uh, we could do this as bending. Uh, you could potentially do injection molding if this was a small enough part in the right materials, um, or just full, you know, simultaneous five-axis machining or uh, multiple setups and multiple part orientations on a traditional three-axis machine. All of those are good options, but they do get very cost uh, prohibitive very quickly. Uh, on almost all of them, have that same issue we mentioned with tooling. This is one linkage in one part, and you need custom tooling to make this one part. As soon as the engineer comes back and says, oh, I need it to be about a half inch longer, or oh, we need a different one that's a, a mirror of this part. Well, now you have to make all that tooling all over again. Um, and that's just for these two parts, right? But with additive manufacturing, this part can be made today and a mirror of this part can be made tomorrow with no change in the equipment, no change in the hardware. Uh, and the machining side has been dramatically reduced as well. So just to give you a quick summary as we show some really interesting hybrid parts on the screen here, Hybrid manufacturing has a, a ton of benefits for the average shop, right? Um, so one of the big things is your design complexity. You can really enable your engineers to kind of take an idea and run with it, right? A lot of times we'll have to compromise between what the best part for the application is and what the reality of manufacturing that part means. 
Is the part going to be prohibitively expensive? Is it going to be impossible to machine? Well, with additive manufacturing, we're enabling our engineers to really push the bounds of what is possible and produce some truly amazing parts that are uh, shattering records and really changing the way that we look at fabrication as a whole. Um, it's also enabling us to do uh, more effective lights out manufacturing and really get the cost of these parts down. Uh, these machines are much easier to uh, babysit, for lack of a better word, in a large industrial environment. So you can have a, you know, an operator to machine ratio that's much higher than with traditional equipment. So really enabling us to drive down the cost of material, uh, cost of production, uh, which is also enabling us to bring more fabrication back to the United States. Uh, another big thing that we like to see with hybrid manufacturing is these uh, impossible geometries. It's certainly the most uh, exciting and interesting thing to showcase. Um, we have some of the computationally designed parts that we were mentioning before that they don't look like anything a human being could ever come up with. Um, and they're, they're truly fascinating parts. Um, that being said, you do have to keep in mind that it's a process like any other. You have to make sure that you're designing for that application and for that process. Uh, you need to make sure that you're aware of the limitations of your particular application. Uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of different styles of 3D printing out there. Uh, there is probably a right fit for your application, but it's important to go through and do your homework to make sure you're not trying to shoehorn a part into an application that it wasn't designed for. Uh, like any other manufacturing technology, there are limitations that you need to be aware of, uh, but also strengths that you can leverage to really be uh, effective. Uh, Kenny, do you have anything to, to add here before we jump into some Q&A? No, I think uh, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, some of the uh, the tech that uh, that comes out with the additive, especially like the multi-material, um, adding one metal on top of another metal. Uh, I think that stuff is, is really cool. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more of that. Um, and just the computational engineering, you know, allowing uh, you put in your, your specs into a computer program and it spits out a part, which is uh, pretty crazy. And we're going to see a lot more of that rolling forward. Um, so we're excited to kind of uh, kind of follow that along and, and see how we can integrate that um, you know with some of the stuff that we're doing on the software side. Wow, that well, I think that's when basically at the end here, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you both. That was very very interesting, also very efficient. So great for you guys. <laughs> uh, ask questions because we have some time, which is great. Um, and well, if you two are ready, uh, I'll get started. Actually, before that, as you can see on the screen, both Kenny and Peter have been nice enough to give their contact information. So if for some reason we also don't have, uh, we don't get to all the questions, so right now I can leave, we will. Uh, or if you have additional things you want to ask, you can also reach out to them directly. Uh, that is not a problem at all. And let's get into it directly. Uh, the first one, oh, and also please, if you would like, you can also upvote the questions because I will also select the ones that are very popular if you guys are showing me that you would like to have them answered. So the first one, which actually has been upvoted twice, is from Clement. Uh, from slide 17, I'm not quite sure what slide that is, I'll let you two look. Um, <laughs> how does the final printed machined part material compared to the traditional billet, and did it require HIP or other treatments? Gotcha. So I think we're talking about the spindle that I have on the screen here. Um, so we have uh, printed, we have not actually machined this part yet. That's coming up in the next week or two here. Uh, we have to produce a few more of these first. Um, material properties we can talk about kind of in general. Uh, it's going to depend on what 3D printing process that you're using. Uh, for us, this particular part was produced with desktop metal binder jetting. Um, mm -hmm. Binder jetting is a little different than some of the other systems people might be familiar with, like the laser systems. Um, for context, what we're doing is it's still a powder-based process. Um, so we're going to spread a thin layer of powder, and then we'll deposit a liquid binder onto the part to uh, essentially create our parts. Um, but at that stage, it's just a green part. The metal is just kind of loosely glued together. You can think of it that way. Um, from there, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a sintering furnace. That's going to burn off that binder, and it's going to solidify the metal. Uh, because this is a, a centered metal process, you actually end up with fairly strong material properties. Um, you get pretty much fully dense parts, high 90s, like 98, 98, uh, 98 99% solid parts. Um, and material properties are fairly comparable to uh, wrought billets. That will depend on what material you're working with. For the stainless steels, you're within 10 to 15% of your wrought materials, um, but it does depend on what material characteristic you're looking at. Interestingly enough, there are actually some, uh, some materials and properties where it's actually a little bit stronger than uh, traditional wrought steels. Uh, there's just some interesting metallurgy stuff there that a uh, bit of a tangent, we could talk about that another day. Um, this particular part, we don't expect to need any hipping, uh, hot isostatic pressing. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, essentially, if you had a part that was uh, had some voids in it, for example, may have had some porosity, 
Uh, well, if you had a, a simple cube, you put that in a nice little uh, nice little shape and you'd press down while it's nice and hot and you'd squish it all together and get all those voids out. But for a, a more organic shape, I don't really know how you'd, you'd press on that, right? So what we do is we actually use air pressure to do that. Uh, so we put it into a large uh, furnace essentially that's under very, very high gas pressure uh, raise the part up to an elevated temperature, and we're able to squish that part from all sides evenly to uh, compress it and get all of those voids out of the part. Uh, for this particular part, we don't expect that to be needed here. Uh, the part is actually a little over spec as far as our factor of safety, um, so this should be fine right after machining. Extremely interesting. Thank you so much. And actually, I think this next question, well, either one of you can answer, but it might be uh, well for me. I think Kenny, you uh, would have a great perspective on this. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what are the challenges that a company might face when adopting the hybrid process specifically rather than just CNC machining or 3D printing? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, probably one of the, uh, the biggest challenges is just having the right personnel. Um, so mm -hmm. it's very different between CNC machining and additive manufacturing. Uh, it's, you know, you don't, what we do uh, specifically with some of our service bureaus and job shops, uh, if they're looking to get into the additive side, we say, you know, get an FDM printer. Most already have one, uh, but get something that works well and that won't annoy your machinists. <laughs> so get them something that they can play with. They can go on Thingverse. Uh, they can just get some models. You know, they don't have to do their own designs. Um, we have our machinist, Tim. Uh, he prints stuff all the time on our FDM machines. It's our FDM machine right now, it's it's in the office. It is going nonstop at producing um, just little uh, uh, holding things for screws, everything else for organizational. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, so for, for some pictures and other stuff, just, just easy stuff. But it, it allows them to get uh, familiar with the process. Um, but having the right person for each, I mean, if you're if you're AM heavy, you need to hire a machinist that knows what they're doing uh, to help you out on the CNC side. And if you're just CNC and everyone knows machining, it's probably best to hire someone uh, that's familiar with additive, that is uh, you know, a manufacturing engineer, uh, that is somewhat familiar with the DFAM process. Um, that's usually the, the best way to really get this going quickly. If you have the right personnel, everything else kind of falls in place. Um, other than that, you just need enough room to, to put all this machine in, the, in one spot, and with, uh, which is something, uh, a problem that we have here because uh, we, we want to keep adding and we're running out of room quickly. So <laughs> just make sure you have the facility capable of, uh, of handling this, but, um, but the benefits outweigh everything else. So eventually, once you start getting this integrated, after about six months of everyone working together, um, you don't have any problems anymore. Everything's just working very smoothly. Uh, everyone's on the same page. And, uh, and that's you know, what we help with a lot is, uh, is that integration and making sure that you get to that point where everyone's working on the same team. Everyone knows what everyone else is doing uh, and it just works great. Yep. Great, just thank to, you very much. Mm, please. Yeah. Just to add on to that too, another thing that we've seen that's pretty common is uh, a lot of times, especially for uh, like aerospace and defense customers, they have some pretty tight requirements on things like material properties and material specs. Uh, and obviously, this is a whole new technology that is not very thoroughly explored. Uh, so qualification has been definitely a big challenge that we're running sure. into. Um, a lot of that just comes down to creating a, a thorough qualification plan and being able to just show, uh, show your customers, show your engineers, show your uh, governing bodies that the parts that come off these machines really are equivalent to parts you would make with other traditional manufacturing methods. Um, the hardest part can be coming up with that qualification plan, but if you're an ISO 9000 company, you already have some of those plans in place. You just got to go through the motions again. Um, but yeah, a lot of education on just, yes, they, they do produce parts. They are metal parts. They are just <laughs> as strong and as efficient and as effective as other parts. Um, but there's a lot of education that has to go with that. And it's, well, it's true as well. I think that the process is something that people often undermine and it's very important to have the full integration and the full understanding of everything from start to end. Um, okay, next question as well. Uh, well, either one of you, but this sounds like a key question to me. Is could you tell us a bit more about the design specifications that you would need in addition to DFAM? Uh, what are tools a user could adopt to make the process smoother if they don't have a TIM, for example? <laughs> gotcha. Um, so on the design specifications, uh, obviously it's going to depend on uh, the part you're using and the processes you have available to you. Um, so simple one, for example, might be how much material do I need to leave so that I can actually clean up that part and get that into tolerance. Um, if you have a system that produces fairly repeatable, reliable, consistent dimensions, then you can start fighting to get as close to that net shape as you can. 
Uh, if you have a system that has a little more regularity to it, or if you have a geometry that's just a little hard to control, generally it's better to be safer and just add extra material there and be able to work back to a surface that you know is good. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, it, it's very, uh, very dependent on the process itself. Um, and each one has its own kind of considerations. Are overhangs a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, do we need supports or do we not need supports? Um, but there are, uh, there are a ton of really good software simulation tools out there. Just depends on what ecosystem you're in. Um, most major CAD packages offer their own versions, their own flavors of these uh, generative uh, design tools that are out there. Um, one of the areas that we're still looking to see some improvement in is on the simulation side for uh, FEA, finite element analysis. Um, a lot of these additive parts, one of the benefits to them is that you can do uh, light weighting, you can add lattice structures to the parts, uh, which is great, but it can be hard to model that for simulation. Um, and so you either have to just put a, a factor on the part and say, yeah, it's 30% as strong as a, a part without that light weighting. Uh, or sometimes you can try and model in those lattice structures, but then it becomes uh, computationally difficult. Um, <laughs> so that is definitely an area we're looking to see some improvement on on the software side of things. Uh, but there's been an explosion in software development in the last few years. So I don't think it'll be long before we see some improvements there. Great, thank you so much. Um, and this next question I'll ask uh, that I think you kind of answered it earlier, so feel free to give a shorter explanation as well if you'd like. Uh, but an anonymous attendee also asked, would it be possible to make this, or this is uh, fortuitous, this EV spindle just with AM uh, because we have the hybrid approach, but would it be possible otherwise? Uh, quick answer is possibly. Uh, we're, able to get pretty, <laughs> <laughs> we're able to get pretty close with this part. Um, Unfortunately, just the way that this is assembled, most of the uh, mating features on this end up being press fits. Um, and so the, uh, the exact dimension and tolerance of those features is, is very important. Um, if you're half a thou too big or too small, parts can literally just fall right out of another component with, uh, when you're dealing with press fits like that. Um, if there were slightly different mounting mechanisms used, there's actually a pretty good chance you could use this part right off the machine. Um, but it is application dependent and how tight those tolerances need to be. Um, but with uh, some of the systems out there, yeah, that definitely could be possible. Okay, great. And actually, I'm going to skip a little bit because since we just mentioned tolerances, uh, Stein does ask what tolerances are attainable, I'm assuming, uh, with the hybrid data pumping process. Gotcha. So uh, on the hybrid side, you can hit whatever you need to hit. Um, it's really just limited by how <laughs> uh, how precise your, uh, your subtractive side of the equation is, right? Um, you can go sub-tenths, you can hold millions if you have a, enough time and a most, an expensive enough machine. Um, realistically, the uh, I think what a lot of people are curious about is how tight can you get on the just the additive side of things? You know, can we eliminate or avoid needing to do the subtractive side of things? Um, that again, system and geometry dependent. Uh, for the binder jetting stuff, we're typically seeing reliability or sorry, repeatability around plus or minus 10 thousandths of an inch. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a geometry that you've worked and refined on and you've done some studies on, you can pretty easily get that down to about five thousandths of an inch. Um, but again, geometry and process dependent. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, well, this next one, we'll go back into design a little bit, again, from an anonymous attendee. Um, so what are the necessary SolidWorks and SolidCAM modules needed to produce a complete 3D print part with an additive manufacturing CNC? Uh, he specifies, or she, I don't know, specifies a 3D model, slicing of the part, and finally 3D printing. Gotcha. Um, so different uh, OEMs will have different software solutions for that. Um, as far as CAD goes, generally speaking, any uh, CAD platform will work. Most AM platforms are uh, 3D model agnostic. As long as you can turn it into an SDL or similar mesh file, uh, that'll be sufficient. Uh, the slicing, very often companies will provide their own slicing software, and very rarely will you see that integrated into an existing CAD package. Uh, there are some exceptions. I know that Fusion 360 is working on some of their slicing modules. Um, I believe SOLIDWORKS is probably working on something similar as well. NX has some uh, plugins as well. Um, but that's really dependent on the, the 3D printing manufacturer if they're going to provide that software for that. A lot of times the slicing softwares in those CAD packages are meant to be more generic, which means that they're typically a little more limited than the one provided by the OEM. Uh, on the subtractive side of things, obviously we, we'd recommend you use solid cam, but uh, <laughs> again, the machining away is generally speaking cam uh, agnostic. As long as it can control whatever CNC machine you're using, it can work for this hybrid solution. Uh, as far as integrated solutions, that's where there's definitely fewer options on the market. Um, we're actively developing our hybrid solutions for CAM right now, uh, working with a couple OEMs to develop that. Um, I believe NX may also have some hybrid solutions as well, um, but that's probably the, the biggest gap in the market that we're seeing currently is for the 
uh, what we refer to as simultaneous hybrid solutions, where you have both an additive head and a subtractive head in the same system. Uh, there are very few CAD CAM uh, packages that handle that effectively right now. Uh, so we are a little limited on choices there. Well, the market is always evolving, so it'll be interesting to see what comes up in the coming, well, even months, quite fast. <laughs> um, well, just keeping kind of in the design theme as well, uh, when you spoke about simulation, well, Daniel asks, you have a name, when you spoke about simulation, did you mean stress analysis? He mentioned, he believes to some degree that it can be done in SolidWorks or separate software. Uh, SolidWorks absolutely has FEA tools for uh, stress, strain, and a number of other things, as well as uh, thermal simulations. I don't know offhand if they have uh, tools to simulate uh, some of the lightweighting lattice infills. Um, I know that Fusion does have some, though they are uh, they just released out of beta a few months ago, so they're still a little new. Um, but on the SolidWorks side, I'm not sure offhand. They very easily might be. They come out with stuff pretty frequently. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a rapidly changing market. Um, okay, keep going. If I, uh, Peter, this is for you again. Uh, could you please explain a bit more about the benefits and limitations of the two different types of hybrid manufacturing? You mentioned simultaneous and sequential. Um, and further question, when might you choose one over the other? Absolutely. Uh, so a lot of the times that's going to come down to what types of parts you're producing and what's unique about their geometries. Um, one of the cool things with simultaneous manufacturing is that uh, there might be features of a part that are uh, occluded or blocked from traditional subtractive manufacturing if the part was in its finished state. Um, so, for example, if you had a part with internal cooling channels, um, the as printed finish on the inside of those walls may not be suitable for whatever you're trying to do, uh, situational dependent. Um, and so if you went with the sequential method where you just print the whole part and then machine it, well, there's not a ton you can do to those internal channels. There are some uh, interesting techniques like extrusion honing and things like that, uh, but you're you're pretty limited. With the simultaneous, you're going to have access to the inside of those channels for while they're being printed. So you can pause the printing process while you have access to those features, you can do your machining for whatever you need in that location, and you just print on top and keep on going. Um, so definitely useful if you have geometries that are uh, otherwise not accessible once the part is in its finished state. Uh, one of the downsides is this tends to be a lot slower. Obviously, you're pausing that additive process constantly. You're bringing over a new tool head. You're subtracting away. So they're generally much, much slower than if you were doing um, the sequential technique. With the sequential technique, uh, especially for things like binder jetting or um, a lot of the resin-based printers where you're doing entire layers in one go, you can do really high volume production, very high throughput production. Um, so if you don't have those requirements where you need to get at the inside of the part, you can produce a ton of parts this way. Um, you can get creative with your fixturing on the subtractive side and get much higher throughput than you would with the, uh, the simultaneous methods. That makes sense. Um, thank you very much. Well, also just a reminder, we still have a few questions to go through, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in um, and to upvote as well. We have a few that are not completely, but weighing that, I will just keep answering the ones that we have. Uh, so next one from, I apologize if I get this right, Kenan. <laughs> what are the best ways to achieve lowered surface roughness? Um, so one of the starting points will be choosing the right uh, additive technology. So uh, laser-based systems, for example, you tend to get a lot more uh, spattering, spalding, uh, or surface finish in general. Uh, binder jetting, you get a fairly consistent uh, surface finish. I want to say it's around 2 RA uh, microns. I think that's 80 RA micro inch, if that means anything to the person who asked. Um, so starting with a, a more consistent and even surface is going to make the uh, post-processing steps e uh, a lot easier and a lot quicker. Um, from there, you have all of your traditional finishing options, uh, vibratory tumbling, um, hand polishing, all those things. Uh, what we're seeing a lot of interest in recently for getting those really, uh, really smooth, very high gloss surfaces are um, isotropic super finishing, which is a, a wonderful mouthful. Engineers come up with great <laughs> names. Uh, it's a fancy word for tumbling it in a bath with some chemicals that kind of provide a bit of a surface treatment, make that tumbling a little more effective. Um, that's one of the big ones that we're seeing. And then electro polishing is also one that we're seeing uh, make a pretty large, uh, pretty large impact in the additive world. Um, so those two technologies are pretty useful if you're going for a very, very high quality surface finish. Great. Uh, but surface prep is the, the main thing. Start with as good a surface as you can. <laughs> it's always the start. Okay. 
Um, and well, changing the topic a little bit, another anonymous attendee uh, asked, are all 3D printing materials compatible with CNC? <laughs> yeah. um, that's a fun one. Uh, you can, theoretically, you can machine whatever you want on a CNC machine as long as you have the right machine, the right cutters, the right recipe, right? Um, I have seen people machine everything from uh, foams and lightweight plastics all the way to literally machining tungsten carbide, ceramics, glass, and diamond. Uh, so technically, yes, you can cut pretty much anything, but the class of machine you might need to do that gets uh, potentially very prohibitive very quickly. Um, generally, metals and plastics work just fine. Um, there are some specific considerations there, right? You have these uh, super alloys that everyone loves to print with, which can be very, uh, very mean to your machines. So having the right tooling, the right coolant, the right recipes is very important. Um, with plastics, there are certainly some plastics that have uh, like lower melting points. So they may get gummy. You may accidentally melt them instead of trying to cut them. Uh, on the other end, you might end up with uh, very brittle things. A lot of uh, resin printers, for example, produce somewhat brittle components. And if you try and machine that, you may end up with chipping or uh, broken pieces in that regard. Uh, Quick answer though, yes, you can machine just about anything you'd like, uh, but the getting the right equipment to do so can be rather uh, arduous. So yes, and, and, don't, <laughs> and don't forget to discuss with your machinist, your service bureau first, uh, before you just send them a part of who knows what material, uh, you know, talk to them. They, they might have some specific way of doing it that it'll work or might tell you, you know, convince you not to do that. <laughs> yep. Communication is always important, even when making parts. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. Um, well, continuing on a little bit, uh, another quite specific, uh, another question is, what are the required steps to remove 3D uh, sorry, 3D printing support using CNC machining? Uh, excellent question. Um, so obviously, it will depend on what material those supports are made out of and what style of supports they are. Uh, so for example, on the binder jetting side, a lot of times we'll have kind of self-releasing support structures. Um, so when we go to actually center those parts, uh, we will oftentimes spray the supports with a ceramic release layer. That means that that uh, support isn't actually going to be fused to the part once you take it out of the centering furnace. Um, so in that case, the support just falls away and you're, you're good to go. Um, there are times when we will actually add supports that are directly fused to the part. Um, so this is a great example of that, where we've added in support structures that are a permanent part of, the, of that piece once it's centered. Um, in those cases, you can machine them away directly on the machine itself, um, or you can do some prep. For these ones, because they're one-offs, we'll probably just knock them off with a, like a Dremel or a cutoff wheel, um, just because interrupted cuts on lathes isn't ideal. Um, and this isn't mass production. This doesn't have to be as efficient as it can be. Um, Generally, more accurate modeling in your CAM software will help you a ton. So if you can actually uh, ensure that the support structures are modeled into the part, that will help you on the programming side of things. Uh, you don't have to worry about accidentally diving your tool into a location that has support because there's more or less there than you were expecting. Uh, some styles of supports, like off some laser machines, they're getting better and better at kind of uh, breakaway or peel away supports where you can just, with a pair of pliers, remove the, uh, the bulk of those supports. Um, and then you can just do some lighter cleanup passes on the CNC side. Um, obviously, anything you can do to minimize the amount of supports that you have to clean up, the better. There are some practical limitations to what the printers are capable of, um, but obviously less is more, right? If you can do uh, less post-processing on the back end, that's, that's always beneficial. So eliminating them up front is very useful. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to have a more accurate model of where those supports are on the part uh, before you get into the cam side of things for subtractive, uh, very, very useful. Okay, right, thank you. It's true, when we're talking 3D printing, supports are an important factor. Yes. Um, and continuing on actually with design, <laughs> since you mentioned it, Michael is, what well, Michael has asked and stated, I use an AI-based functional design software. However, these parts are sometimes quite difficult to print. Do you have a proper software? Um, so SolidCam itself doesn't produce any uh, like uh, generative design tools or software in that nature. Um, there are a number of programs out there. Uh, Entopology always comes to mind first. They're a, a pretty big name in the space. Um, one of the ways that you can work with that is understanding some of the uh, best practices for your particular printer and, if possible, building those into your simulation. So a lot of those tool sets like Entopology, for example, um, you can set certain uh, parameters manually. So if you wanted to create a lattice infill structure, for example, and you know what the minimum thickness your printer can print is, set that in that software directly so it doesn't produce geometries that are below that threshold. Um, if you know 
Uh, a maximum overhang angle, for example, is something that comes up pretty often. Uh, some softwares will let you put that in as a parameter. Don't create any unsupported features that are over that angle or try to minimize the number of them that are there. Um, again, that's going to be software dependent and what tools that they provide for you, but that's always really, really useful is uh, upfront trying to bound what those tools are going to create for you so that you don't have to kind of work backwards and think, oh gosh, they, they've made this great part, but I, I can't print that on this particular machine. Um, and then of course, the other option is uh, if your particular printing platform isn't capable of those uh, geometries, see if there are other systems out there that are. Um, there are uh, more 3D printing technologies than I think any of us can count. Um, and there's probably one that can meet what you need for those particular requirements. Might be more expensive, might have a smaller build volume, but uh, look around, there's new technology out all the time. I would agree with that. There are so many different 3D printing technologies that I don't think I could count them. <laughs> uh, actually, that will lead me into uh, another question from an autonomous attendee, which, how could you get started with 3D printing? A little bit of a change from the CNC questions. Kenny, you want to take this one? I think uh, we've, we've indoctrinated you enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How to get started with 3D printing. Uh, the, the best way, you know, go out and purchase a 3D printer. There are options that are $100. They go slow. Uh, they'll give you all the problems, which is perfect. So you have to, you know, troubleshoot yourself. You're going to be printing parts to rebuild your machine as you go. Um, a lot of people I talk to, they start with one 3D printer, they start printing their second 3D printer, and then they go back and redesign their first 3D printer. So th that's the best way. Just just jump into it. Um, the technology has gotten so cheap, uh, you can get, you know, uh, go down to your local store. You probably get something for about a hundred bucks. Um, Print with some PLA, just some plastics, go online. YouTube is a great way to learn uh, and it will run you through all of the problems that you will eventually see. Um, there are plenty of support groups <laughs> for when you, uh, you know, when you start printing spaghetti, what, what went wrong? Someone's out there, they will help you. Give us a call. I mean, you know, but, but the best way is just to dive in. Um, you know, uh, Fusion 360 is a great tool for CAD. It's free for, you know, most hobbyists and everything like that. Um, go on there, design some squares and start printing them. Absolutely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and can confirm that actually I think there are a, lot, a few 3D printers out there that are less than $100. Yes. So you can definitely find them. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot print metal with them. I feel like I should make that clear, but yes. polymers, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, and I think, well, unless we get any others in the next couple of minutes, well, actually we're running out of time anyway. Um, well, this is a good question to end it on anyway. Uh, from the anonymous attendee again, I think we were a little shy. Uh, where can you see if the true value of having ad hybrid manufacturing rather than just additive or subtractive? Specifically, are there any certain sectors where it might be more suited? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, as I mentioned, aerospace and defense are generally pretty big proponents of this. Um, they're the kind of industries where the answer is what makes the best part. Um, they're mm -hmm. generally, they don't care how much it costs, they need to make the best part for the application. Uh, and oftentimes that uh, kind of necessitates a hybrid approach. Uh, we mentioned things with uh, you know internal cooling channels or very organic geometries that you just can't actually get access to without doing something like that. Um, we showed the, the skateboard truck. Uh, you, you can't get a tool in to machine most of that geometry. So if this is the best way to make trucks for this skateboard, you have to go at it with a hybrid approach. Um, and then you can machine your critical external features later. Um, so definitely application specific, but aerospace and defense are, are huge uh, proponents of this type of technology. Uh, really any time where the, the right answer is what is the best part? Because generally speaking, it's, it's gonna be something like this. And what a great way to end. Well, I don't see anything else. So I would say thank you, uh, Peter and Kenny for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. Oh, it was great having Excellent. you be our moderator. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And well, as a reminder to everyone else, actually, if we could just go to the last slide, um, you can see here that there's contact information for both Peter and Kenny. So if you think of some questions later, if you're a little too shy to ask in front of everyone, that's fine. You can get in touch with either of them. Also feel free to get in touch with 3D Native to if you would like to see the recording afterwards, it will be available probably in the coming days. But thank you as well to our audience for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you for all the fantastic questions and hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye.